The ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another ANA e-learning presentation. The ANA would like to thank our e-learning e partner Graysheet for their support of our e-learning program. Today we have Caleb Audette who will be presenting the incredibly diverse world of Confederate States paper money episode two. Uh, episode one was on uh, June 10th. You can see that if you go back in our recorded uh, ELA presentations. So all attendees will be muted for this presentation. If you have any questions, you may put them in the chat or Q&A box, and I will review them with Mr. Audet at the end of the presentation. I will now turn the floor over to our presenter, Caleb. Sir, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, so yes, hello everyone um, in this virtual world. <laughs> I am Caleb Audet. Um, I'm a 16-year-old YN. Uh, over in Florida. So yes, here, let me share my screen. Uh, there we go. All right, so everyone should be able to see that. And now I will advance. Uh, so there's the title slide. We'll be talking about a lot of these notes um, throughout the presentation. I just wanted to mention like I did last time, um, you know, there's some uh, topics that are offensive to some people nowadays um, just know i'm not here to offend anybody i'm just here to do an informational presentation um, on confederate states paper money because it's a really cool topic and i love the um, history like i said most of these notes that you see on here we will be talking about today so let's dive in uh, so I just kind of wanted to give a brief recap. Um, last time we talked a little bit about me, did a slide about that, um, a brief history and overview of the Confederate notes, uh, problems that Confederacy faced, uh, counterfeiting, inflation, a list of printers, engravers, and lithographers that worked on the notes. And we also talked about cancellations and good cuts. We did the rarity scale, um, which you'll need to know. Uh, I will be going through throughout the presentation and saying like an R2 rarity and how many are left. Um, so I'll have that guide for you just in case you didn't catch the last presentation. Again, like Sam said, um, it was done on June 10th. So if you want to go back and watch that recording, a uh, brief biography of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis, uh, the three types of Confederate flags, the stars and bars, stainless banner and the bloodstained banner and their meanings. And there were also types within those types. And then we did T1 through T17, just to jog your memory. Um, T, when I say T dash, um, T means type. So it's just a type of Confederate note. So let's see if I can zoom in here. Uh, so here's type one. And then um, here is type 17. And that's the one that I have. I have it right here, but my background does not allow me to share it with you. So there's a picture. <laughs> All right, moving on to the rest of the types, as you'll notice right here, here's my email. Um, I will include it also in the end of the presentation uh, when we take questions. So if you have any questions that we don't get to in the presentation, if you need any assistance identifying types or varieties, um, if you have comments about how to make the presentation better even, uh, just please feel free to email, email me. Um, hopefully I will be doing more of these um, as time allows. And do not worry as well if you don't read anything, everything I have on the slides, because I'll basically be saying everything on them um, and more sometimes. So the third series was authorized on August 19th of 1861, uh, much longer than any other series in the Confederate um, Notes series, uh, comprised of 25 um, notes. And it, it contained many of the most valuable um, notes, including you know, the T-35 Indian Princess note, uh, T-23, T-32, T-27, which is actually the rarest type, and we'll get to that. Uh, Hoyer and Ludwig, Keaton Jimball, Southern Banknote Company, Leggett, Keaton Jimball, those were all printers. Um, throughout the series. So T18 is a $20 printed by Hoyer and Ludwig, um, put into circulation starting October 24th of 1861. Um, issuance was stopped on August 16th of 1862. Uh, over here we have a sailor um, leaning on a capstan, which uh, a capstan was used for winding rope or cable on a ship. Um, they wound that onto that capstan. And then in the center, you have a sailing ship. Uh, the sailing ship actually appeared on T9. 
uh, from last presentation, and then the sailor appeared on T11 from last presentation, if you remember those, and Hoyer and Ludwig print, printed both of those as well. Uh, 2,366,486 of those were issued, 50,001 to 100,000, so an R2 rarity um, remained today. And this is my example. Um, like I said, again, it's right here, but you can't see it because of my background. T19 was a $20 issued by the Southern Banknote Company. Um, it has navigation in the center. Um, of course, navigation's right there. And then you have a sailing ship. Um, you have a globe, compass, um, various tools that are used in the sea um, or when you go on, um, on a sailing ship. So that's just to let you know it's navigation. Uh, down here we have Minerva, and that's the um, goddess of defensive war in Roman mythology and also the goddess of arts and literature. Uh, then to the right, we have the blacksmith. Um, the blacksmith and Minerva, those both appeared on many other obsoletes um, and the obsolete banknotes. And we'll get to that in a minute um, with obsolete banknotes that have comparison vignettes to um, these Confederate notes. Um, issued January 8th through May 15th of 1862. There's 201 to 500 known, um, so an R7 rarity out of the 14,860 issued. Uh, these are actually rarer in high grades with good cuts than the type 15s. Um, type 15 is actually rarer than these as a whole, um, but again, these are higher, rarer in um, high grades with good cuts. Now, next we have T20, a $20 issued by Blanton Duncan. Uh, another splendid note, uh, all black and white, as you'll see on the slide after next. Uh, June 21st through December 8th of 1862, it was produced. On the left is a portrait of Alexander Stevens, a prominent figure in the Confederacy. Um, he was actually the only vice president of the Confederacy from 1861 to 65. And in his later years, he was also the 50th governor of Georgia. In the center, we have industry, um, seated between a cherub holding the staff of Mercury, the messenger god, and then a beehive, which is the symbol of industry, um, or a symbol anyways. And then finally on the right, a personification of hope is seen leaning on an anchor with a palmetto in the background. Of the 2,834,251 issued, um, there's 50,001 to 100,000 that remain today, so an R2 rarity. Now here's Alexander Stevens, just thought I'd include a little something on him because um, he's so important. Uh, he does look sickly as you'll see from the pictures and he was, um, he suffered from rheumatoid arthritis most of his life and also a pinched nerve in his back. Uh, he often weighed less than 100 pounds, uh, even though he was 5'7", so that's not healthy of course. You can see, you know, how thin his face looks, his arms, his legs, it's just sad really um, and to make matters worse at the end of his life he was helping uh, or towards the end of his life anyways he was helping one of his slaves repair a gate on his property and the um, gate actually fell on him and crippled him um, until he died so now here is um, t20 i want to give you a minute to see if you can discern um, which is the counterfeit and which is the real um, issue so i'll give you a minute like i said to decide that All right, I'm gonna go ahead and reveal it. Um, so it may have been easy to tell for you, may not have been, and that's why we're here to learn more. So if you said the top was the counterfeit, then you got it correct. Um, and the bottom is the genuine. There's several reasons, which I'll show you. Uh, first of all, you can see Steven's face. Um, well, actually really, first of all, is the black signatures. I mean, that's really um, the way, right away where that's, that's kind of your red flag. Um, the, the serial numbers are handwritten, but the signatures are not. Um, you can see on the left, Stephen's face, there's less details. He looks uh, actually kind of more like a baboon. Um, and he has uh, the black is um, the shadows, of course. They're supposed to be shadows, but they look more like a beard on him. These on the bottom where the genuine is, um, they're more you know natural looking, um, blended into the background, which is how they should be. And then in the center, um, the cherub, I'll zoom in so you can see him on the counterfeit. Um, kind of looks like an old man, actually. And then if you go down here, it's more of a um, cherub look, you know, a babyish look like he's supposed to look. Uh, over here, 
the um, mouth is different on industry. You can see uh, this is actually more lifelike. Honestly, um, that's the one thing the counterfeit did get right was the mouth, uh, mouth on industry. Um, you can see this one's kind of smashed into the nose. And then over here, you have less details on Hope's face. There's the genuine and then there's the counterfeit. So you can see those that less details um, on there. Now on to T21, um, issued by Key and Jabal at $20. Um, Stevens, again in the center, actually looks, in my opinion, more, more like a flat, more of a flattering picture um, than, well, real life and uh, T20. Issued from June 28th through November 15th of 1862. Uh, around him, around this portrait, you have many examples of industry. You have on the left, uh, looks like a, a plant or a mill of some kind. Over here, you can see the smokestacks. Um, you also have a barrel, you have a wheel, um, a metal wheel, you have a uh, hammer. And then on the right side, you can see the bales of cotton, you have a cornucopia, and then a sailing ship in the distance. So those are all symbols of industry. And that's what they were getting at there. Um, green lath work around basically everything, you know, you have over here, especially. Um, now issued, uh, 164,248 issued and then 5,001 to 10,000 that remain today. So an R4 rarity, um, you will see, if you remember from last presentation, I was saying how I was going to show you a few um, examples of Confederates that were really horribly cut and we didn't get to that. Um, but this time, well, I did show you a few last time, but I'm going to show you more this time. Um, this one is a really bad example. Um, you can see, you know, it's okay over here, but then they really cut off um, well, they cut off half of the plate letter right there. Um, and of course, the um, border right there, they cut all of that off and even into the design over here. Um, so that's a pretty bad cut. And that was on a lot of them because they were scissors. Um, they cut them out with scissors and they just, like I said, hand cut. They had to get them out no matter what, because there were a lot of there was a lot of demand for these. Um, so just scissor cut them, get them out however you can. And that's the result. <laughs> Now, T22 was printed by the Southern Bank Note Company, a $10, um, one of my personal favorites because of just all the vignettes, and then you have the um, orange red underprints. Uh, this over here to the left, you have Thetis, um, a sea nymph that was one of the 50 daughters of Nereus, um, the son of Gaia, the earth goddess, and Pontus, the sea god. Um, Nereus was also known as the old man of the sea. Um, she's holding a trident, Thetis is right there. You can see a um, common theme of sea gods and goddesses in both Greek and Roman mythology, especially with Neptune for Roman mythology and Poseidon with Greek mythology. Um, to the, in the center right here, we have Native Americans. And then over to the right, we have um, a random, just a random female holding um, an X representing the 10 denomination Roman numerals. And then you have her also holding an ear of corn. Um, this is another example of a not so good cut. You can see they cut into the design at the right. Um, it means cutting off the frame line to the bottom as well. Um, so really tightly cut um, and not that's, you know, not a lot of them, you don't want to look for that. Um, like that's what we were talking about last time with good cuts. Um, 1,001 to 5,000 known today, which is an R5 rarity out of the 58,860 issued from November 13th of 1861 to May 15th of 1862. Now the next type, um, definitely one of my personal favorites is the um, T23, a $10, like Key and Jambal did this one, issued from November 15th through December 30th of 1861. Um, one of my personal favorites just because of the history behind it. Um, now to the left, we have John Ward. He was, he had a lot of different positions in his lifetime. Uh, he was, you see right here, I mean, he served as Georgia's U.S. Attorney, the Mayor of Savannah, Georgia, Speaker of Georgia's House of Representatives, um, Georgia State Senate's President. He was also um, the United States Minister to China under President Buchanan, um, who was President from 1857 to 1861. And then probably the most important um, occupation that he had in numismatics anyways is the President of the Mechanic Savings Bank, um, we will get to that in a minute why, uh, but that's in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, in the center of the note, you have uh, a, a wagon loaded with bales of cotton and then a slave's driving at the overseers over here. Um, and then this guy's carrying some cotton as well. 
And then down to the right, we have a vignette of a corn gatherer. And this corn gatherer appeared on, on lots of obsoletes as well. Uh, I just included two on the slide after next, as you'll see. Um, now this is mine. Uh, it's graded by PMG, but I cut off the holders so you can see more of the note. Um, it has a nice uh, orange, orangish red underprint. Um, that's really what you want to look for on these because a lot of them are um, oxidized and uh, and or faded. Uh, with oxidization, that causes it to become kind of like a dirty um, brownish, yellowish, um, orangish. The, just again that dirty color um even sometimes black um so if i mean they're still nice if you get them like that because of the vignettes but um if you you know if you want a nicer example then that's what you want to look for is that um those underprints uh friculus hammer cut cancel notes at 900 just for vg um, and 1700 for vg for non-cancel notes uh that's just book value of course so it's going to be a little less um, however, I have been seeing them um, in hammer cut canceled uh, going for, you know, they can go from anywhere from 1700 to um, 2200 for just a VF. So um, they're pretty desirable right now. Leggett, Keaton, Jimball. I remember Leggett was thrown out because he was accused of being a union informant. Um, so that's probably one of the main reasons why it's so it's rare. Um, 20,333 made, uh, 501 to 1000 remain today. So an R6 rarity. And Again, very rare, um, very desirable, especially in high grades like XF and AU. Now here's that $10 mechanic savings bank, obsolete bank note. Um, like Keegan Jen Ball actually took the plates for this note and um, they made the, uh, so the plates for this note and then they made the T23 um, because it was just so well engraved and it would be a waste of money for them to have to um, create more plates, you know, for something else. Um, so they just took these, the original engravers um, for the obsolete were Bald Adams and Company and Bald Kuzlin and Company. Uh, so that's the $10 mechanic savings bank. This one's mine. It's off at grading right now, but um, that's mine. So, um, and like I said, the only real example is that um, bank name and then the date and then also the underprint. Um, dates 1857 on this one and the um, T23 is 1861. Now here's some more examples of obsoletes that are um, you know, comparable to those, uh, that T23. Over here, you can see the corn gatherer vignette uh, to the right. And then over here as well, uh, this is a corporation of Alexandria $5 in Alexandria, Virginia. And then this is a Farmers and Mechanics Bank, um, New Jersey note, a $20. And if you'll also remember this one, this vignette um, appeared last time on T14. Um, so that's, the, and they, you can see too, it's basically the same note. Um, they're not all that different except for the second, the central vignette and the denomination, of course, and the bank. Um, so I guess that was a common theme with Ball Kuzlin and company. They like to print notes that were, you know, like kind of the same. Um, and again, it was to save money, which is understandable. <laughs> now on to T24, this is printed by Leggett, Keenan, Jim Ball, again, a $10. Um, February 20th through December 8th of 1862. On the left is a portrait of RMT Hunter. Uh, he was the CSA Secretary of State. He also held jobs um, like U.S. Representative to Virginia and also U.S. Senator for 14 years uh, from 1847 to 61. He was a strong supporter of slavery as well. He actually owned a plantation of his own. So that's one of the reasons why he was put on this note, that and the fact that he was the Secretary of State. Um, and then over here to the right, we have Elwin, um, the Reverend Dr. Alfred L. Elwin. Um, he was actually a strong abolitionist uh, and wanted the nation to be unified. So no one knows the real reason that he was put on this note, um, maybe because he was cute, I don't know. Uh, but you know, he's kind of cute down here, um, but that's him as a baby, but so nobody really knows why. Um, but yeah, it's a cool vignette anyways. Uh, of the 278,400 issued, 5,001, 10,000 remain today. So an R4 rarity. Um, Problem-free AU notes are especially prized by collectors. Um, so if you find that, you know, uncanceled, um, no problems, no comments, um, those are really desirable. You know, you can pay, I mean, anywhere from 1,500 to 2,200. Um, I've seen like AU 58, say, um, for like two grand. Um, so yeah.
Now we have T25, a $10 printed by Keaton Jimball. Um, it was issued from May 12th through August 9th of 1862. Another portrait of RMT Hunter, the same one, see? Um, but the same one over here. And then you have in the center, a personification of Hope leaning on an anchor. You can see that right there. And then you have C.G. Memminger, um, Christopher Gustavus Memminger. And he was actually, he had many jobs as well. Um, the most notable being the Secretary of the Treasury for the Confederacy. Um, he orchestrated the deals with a lot of the printing companies, you know, Keaton Engine Ball, Hoyer and Ludwig, um, B. Duncan, all those different big names that you see that are printing these notes. Um, he was the guy behind, you know, making the deals with them so they could get paid. Uh, he was actually the founder of the whole Confederate money system, uh, both coins and currency as well. I found that kind of cool. Um, and he was also the primary author of the Provisional Constitution of the Confederate States of America, which was basically the CSA's first constitution. So he was pretty high up there. Um, he was on various notes, T33, T53, T60, um, T69, among others. You'll see him on um, T37 is another one. Uh, 178,716 printed and 5,001 to 10,000 remain to date. Uh, so an R4 rarity. Now you'll see this is T26 also um, by Keaton Jimball and you'll see, well, it's the same thing. Um, not quite, it's, it has those red um, X's right there and right there. Uh, but other than that, yes, it is the same thing. Um, they just did that because this type T25 um, was very, very, very heavily counterfeited. Uh, they needed to do something to try to um, get down on that counterfeiting. So they created T26 with those red X's. Uh, it didn't really do much. You know, they, they were still uh, heavily counterfeited and um, it didn't deter counterfeiters too much because all they had to do was add those two red X's and that was it. Um, 514,400 issued, 10,001 to 50,000 remain today, so an R3 rarity. Um, and July 12th through December 8th of 1862, they were issued. Again, Me uh, Memminger to the right, and then you have Hope, and then RMT Hunter to the left. Now we get to T27. This is, like I said, the rarest type um, to date anyways uh, in the whole Confederate series, all 72 types. And it was issued from only from November 26th through December 5th of 1861. Features Liberty at the top left um, with her pole and cap. And then um, a eagle right here. She's uh, seated next to an eagle. And then the seam train on the right. Um, like I said, rarest type. Uh, the finest known is supposedly an XF, but that example has to be seen to confirm that it's an XF. Um, it came on low quality paper, which is why they're mostly all in rough shape. Um, so it could be an XF, it might not be, who knows. Um, this vignette on the top left right here, you'll see, I'll show you on the next slide, uh, Valley Bank of Maryland in Hagerstown, Maryland, a $5 note of 1855 that has a comparison vignette to this one. It's almost the exact same as you'll see. Um, 8,576 of these printed and only 113 exist today. So an R8, almost an R9 rarity. Um, so really, really low printing number. No one knows why, actually. Um, it could be because the plates broke. It could be because they didn't like the design. I don't know why they wouldn't like the design, but it could be. Who knows? Um, no one knows. Researchers have speculated for years and years ever since they were printed as to why it was stopped so suddenly. Um, but it was. So here we are talking about the rarest note and the whole series. Now here's this um, comparison vignette you can see over here and then over here. Uh, this is the Confederate vignette on the T27 and then this is the obsolete vignette. There's its um, placement on that obsolete. You can see uh, it's really the only difference is this one has a little more uh, detail on here and also um, this it's like a mirror or a, um, something like that. And it has a scene in it um, of justice, it looks like. So that's really the only, that doesn't have it right there. So that's really the only difference, like I said, that in the details. Uh, but so there's those two comparison vignettes. Now here's T28, a $10 um, by Hoyer and Ludwig as well. And then JT Patterson picked up the printing. Um, far more common than T27. 
However, it was kind of funny as I was reading, um, doing the research for this presentation, uh, when Grover Criswell and Doug, Douglas Ball and all those big names that uh, cataloged all these, when they were going through a stack of these um, T28s, they actually found a few um, 27s just because i mean look at the um look at the similarities it's almost i mean it's almost identical it's just this vignette up here um that's the only difference see um over here you have series um to the right holding an urn and then commerce to the left and then the steam train and that's i mean that's all that's really all the difference that you have um is that vignette over here so that kind of cool would have been the payday of a lifetime for sure um you know a four to five hundred dollar note and an uncirculated example um you know to fifteen twenty thousand for a vf so that's that would that would have been quite the payday uh but 1,074,980 of these are um, issued from January 23rd through December 13th of 1862. Uh, 10,001 to 50,000 are known to exist today, so an R3 rarity. Um, so there's T28. Now on to T29. Uh, this is kind of cool just because of this vignette over here. I really like this um, vignette on the right. I'll zoom in so you can see it better. Uh, it's, a, it's a river scene, I guess um, they call it. Over here, you have a boat, um, the, of course, the water, the river, uh, mountains in the background, trees, rocks. So that's kind of just a cool little vignette. You can see you know, the relation of um, size to the um, note. It's just a little vignette, but it's kind of cool. Um, and then in the center, you have a vignette of um, slaves hoeing, uh, picking cotton. And then in the background, you can see um, there's some houses right there, some more houses over there. And then it looks like some various tools. You know, you have a hoe, um, all those different tools, a shovel. Um, so that's T29. Now down here, if you'll remember from last presentation, if you watched it, um, I showed you a counterfeit example of that T29. Um, this is a real example, obviously. Um, you can see down here B. Duncan. Um, Blant stands for Bland Duncan. Um, and the counterfeit has an R. Duncan. I guess they just couldn't close that B, um, couldn't close that bottom part. So if it's R. Duncan, it's fake. If it's B. Duncan, it's real. Um, so that's T29. 1,001 to 5,000 are known to exist today out of the uh, 286,627 issued from March 17th through September 13th of 1862. Uh, fully framed notes are very rare. High grade notes like this are very rare as well. This is an AU example. Uh, you're gonna be very hard pressed to find this note in XF or higher, uh, no matter if it has a good cut or not. If you're able to, you know, if, if it is an XF or higher and you're able to buy it because, yeah, they're only gonna go up in value because they're so rare already and then um, it's only going to get rarer as time goes on. Now, this is T30 at $10, um, printed by Blanton Duncan. Kind of a mediocre quality um, when he was still in Columbia, South Carolina. He did this one. Uh, so, you know, not much to this one except um, the center vignette, which is the most interesting thing I find anyways of this note. Um, you have RMT Hunter to the left, Minerva to the right. Um, now, this center vignette was painted by John Blake White, who was an actor, painter, and lawyer. Um, and he died just before the start of the Civil War. Uh, so I guess to honor him, they put this painting, um, General Francis Marion Sweet Potato Dinner. You might have heard of that painting. Um, it's used in many, many obsoletes, especially from the Bank of the State of South Carolina, um, various times for their notes, for their obsoletes. And some of those are highlighted on the next slide. I'll show you um, 1,939,810 issued from June 14th, 1862 to January 3rd of 1863. So that's T30, um, 50,001 to 100,000 known today. So an R2 rarity. Um, now here are those uh, Bank of the State of South Carolina obsoletes. So I'll zoom in so you can see. So this one's a $5. Uh, you can see the vignettes right there. Now, I couldn't really zoom in on it, but um, right here it says painted by John B. White. And then um, over here, General Marion inviting a British officer to dinner. Um, so that's they put on all these Bank of the State of South Carolina obsoletes. Whenever they had this vignette on there, they put his name and then the name of the painting as well. Um, so that's that $5. And then over here, we have a, another $5 Bank of the State of South Carolina. Um, there's that vignette right there. 
And then on the bottom, uh, we have finally over here, the state of South Carolina, a $5 as well. So these are all $5 denominations. Uh, there's that vignette right there. And this was actually issued by the Blue Ridge Railroad Company. Um, it's a revenue bond script, basically an obsolete though, um, issued for the state of South Carolina. So those, there's those three. Um, and here's the vignettes. If you couldn't already see them from me putting them out, then here they are right now. Um, so there, there's those. And then I thought I'd show you my um, bake of the state of South Carolina obsolete as well. Uh, this five dollar you can see um the, it's this note on the top left and i like the green of course of course the vignette in the center um the green uh lab work over here and everywhere really um that's what i like about this one the most now on to t31 this is a five dollar printed by the southern bank note company uh, another beautiful red treasury notes that's what they call them sometimes are red treasury notes um, issued from November 13th of 1861 to May 15th of 1862. Navigation's leaning on a cap stand over here. And then George Washington is actually over here, a statue of him. Um, it was thought to be at one time Chief Justice John Marshall. Um, I don't know what the reason is behind that, why they thought that. Um, he kind of, you know, George Washington, you look at pictures of him and even the statue. Um, he has a really distinct uh, hairstyle. So I, I don't know, there was something, you know, that made him think that it was um, Chief Justice John, John Marshall, but now it's been proven that it is George Washington. Now over here, we have five goddesses. Um, from left to right, we have commerce with a ship behind her and I'll zoom in on this vignette, so don't worry. Um, now over here, we have Ceres with her horn of plenty. And then we have justice with her scales. And I imagine there's a sword behind, she's holding a sword behind that five. Uh, then over here, we have Liberty with her cap and pole. And then finally, we have Industry with her die staff. Um, wool or flax is wound around that die staff for um, spinning. And then she has a cotton mill in the background with a steam train. Let me zoom in on that vignette so you can see. 58,860 of these were issued. Um, and sorry, hold on, let me go over one minute. Uh, 1,001 to 5,000 are known today, so an R5 rarity. So there's that vignette. Um, you can see, you know, commerce and then series, justice, um, liberty, and then industry. So there's T31. Now, actually, um, this statue right here um, is, uh, it has its home in the State House in Boston, Massachusetts. So if you are ever going to be in Boston, Massachusetts, um, if you have time, you'll have to go visit the uh, State House and see that statue and then email me and let me know because I've never been there. Um, let me know how it is, but there's a picture anyways, if you can't get out there. Now here's T32 printed by Leg Keenan Jabal, the $5. Um, this was uh, the $10 and the $5 uh, T23 and T32, this is a pair. Um, another high quality, very pretty and interesting for the history. Um, November 30, 15th through December 30th, 1861, it was issued from uh, the boy, young boy. You'll see him on a whole bunch of obsoletes. And then he's to the left. And then the uh, machinist or blacksmith, whichever you want to call him, um, he's right there with an anvil and hammer. And then there's a steam train. And um, there was a, there's a cotton mill in the background too, um, or a, a um, plant or something like that. Um, faintly, you can see the outlines, but um, this is very desirable, especially um, examples like these because of the orange um, underprint. If you get a full orange underprint like this one, um, that's vibrant and not oxidized or um, faded, it's gonna be worth a lot of money, just like the um, T23 that we showed earlier. Uh, so this machinist as well appeared on lots of obsoletes. Um, 20,333 of these are issued, only 501 to 1,000 are known to exist today, so an R6 rarity. Um, it's one of these types where you don't really worry about the cut, just to own an example is kind of cool. Uh, now, this is the $5 Mechanic Savings Bank, obsolete banknote that they took those um, plates from Bald Adams and Company and Bald Kuzlin and Company and created this T32. Um, you can see the similarities, the bank number or the bank name. Um, the underprint, and of course the date changed. Those are the only three things really that changed. Uh, this is 1859, this is 1861. Um, but this is the $5 Mechanic Savings Bank. 
they estimate there's like nine to 16 of these out there. Uh, this is a very, very, speaking from experience, a very hard, to, <laughs> very, very hard to uh, obsolete to get um, just because there are nine to 16 out there. And it's probably more like the nine uh, just because, I mean, it's just, you cannot find them anywhere. Um, I've been looking for, you know, probably almost a year now, and I've seen like none, um, one, but it's way overpriced. But anyways, um, there's 17 to 32 of the $10 out there as well. Um, so both are very rare and prized by collectors, both many, many times rarer than the um, Confederate notes. But just because the Confederate notes have probably received more popularity, um, they they're worth a little bit more than these. Um, but this one is this one is still, you know, you'll pay probably seven, eight hundred for a, um, you know, a nice find of EF example. Um, so that's, you know, they're they're pretty desirable right now. Now, also, I thought I would show you here's some pictures of those um, that young boy on some of these obsoletes um, state of New York uh, Farmers Bank of Washington Company. These three on the top are all northern obsoletes and then the bottom is southern obsoletes. Um, but this is a five dollar and all six of these this these three and these three are in proof form this one's not but we'll get that uh, to that in a minute um, this one has the young boy right there uh, millville bank of new jersey three dollar and then you have over here the two dollar citizens bank in mount carmel illinois and there's the boy something interesting to note on here is um, they didn't tint his face they they left his face um, untinted. That red tint is not on his face, so that's just kind of an interesting thing. Maybe they wanted to highlight his face. Um, now onto the southern obsoletes on the bottom, we have the Bank of Columbus one dollar one dollar um, proof from Georgia, and there's that boy right there. We have the Farmers Bank of Missouri. There's the boy right there. Um, this is, this vignette is actually comparable to um, type six it is yes um type six of that vignette of george washington and then the farmers bank of missouri um like i said again uh now this vignette over here was actually completely unrelated to um confederates but this vignette actually also appeared on the ten dollar timber cutters bank obsolete now this is finally we have the southern bank of kentucky the five dollar from russellville kentucky and there's the boy right there um this one they call her the saluting maiden um, but she appeared on a lot of obsoletes as well now up here i thought i would also include one with that machinist vignette or blacksmith again whichever you want to call them um, but this is the Far farmer's bank of montage uh three dollar in new jersey and there's that um vignette of that blacksmith so um, and then the steam train, of course, in the back. And then also, um, oh, yes, and I highlighted the vignettes. And then there's the uh, blacksmith. And then the, here's, um, I thought I'd show you my $50 Bank of Yanceyville note. Um, this has in North Carolina, Yanceyville, North Carolina. Um, this has the uh, blacksmith vignette over here to the left. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, they did accentuate um, this whatever it is mill or plant of some sort they accentuated that more and also the steam train they accentuated more uh, cut off a little bit of that anvil um kept the hammer there but cut off a little bit of his tools um, but still one of the fullest that i can find um, besides of course this wantage one and the originals um the mechanic savings bank and the regular t32 um, but, so that's the 50 dollars bank of yanceyville now, T33 is a, kind of an interesting one. You know, um, it was another high quality one issued by like Keaton Jim Ball, uh, $5. Um, now you look at this and go, oh my, that's not really high quality. What are you talking about? Um, this is actually a counterfeit. It's not the regular one. Um, so uh, this is, they call it the bug eyed variety. Um, I'll zoom in and show you. He looks like he has bug eyes, um, kind of Memminger does and um, Minerva looks angry. Uh, I find it kind of hilarious actually that they thought that this would pass, uh, but it did. It passed as real. I mean, you can see there's, um, you know, there's a tear right there, a repaired tear. Um, you got a roundy corners. Um, so it obviously did circulate, although I have no clue why. <laughs> uh, but onto the real type now, this is issued from March 13th through June 19th of 1862. Um, in the center again, Memminger you have, and then to the right is Minerva. Um, there's two different types of the green overprint. You have a um, light green overprint and then a blue green. 
um, over print. And there's actually three types of piece, um, three types of the blue green and three types of the light green. You only really need to know um, the, the one type of blue green and the one type of light green, um, unless you have a really rare variety that you need um, identification for, then it's kind of important to know um, what shade it is. I'll show you that on the next slide. 136,736 of these were issued. Um, 1,001 to 5,000 are known to exist today. So an R5 rarity. Uh, now over here, here are the real examples of the T33. Um, you have on the top, you have the blue green variety and then on the bottom the light green variety. So you, you can tell um, the blue green is a blue green um, variety and then the uh, light green is a lightish kind of a um, yellowish green uh, variety. So there's, there's those two types. Uh, AU and UP is very, very, very hard to find. Um, XF is really hard to acquire as well. So really anything X up, XF and UP, you'll be um, pressed to find it. Um, so, I mean, I think XFs or um, an XF40, you can get it with comments for, you know, 1,000, 1,100. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's kind of where XFs are at now um, for pricing anyways. But so there's, there's those two types. Now on to T34, you'll see, oh, it's the same note. It's just black and white. You're white, you're correct. Um, it is. So you have uh, Memminger right there, and then you have Minerva to the right. Uh, carbon copy of T33, 5,001 to 10,000 exists today. So an R4 rarity of the um, 228,644 put out to the public from May 12th through December 8th of 1862. Um, they aren't quite as expensive as the former type. You can find them easily in XF. Um, also easily find on circulate examples. I mean, they're a little hard, but um, as with every, really every Confederate note, because um, how many survived, you know, from back in the 1860s um, in uncirculated condition. Uh, but you can find them, especially when they're cut canceled, um, then they're much easier to find than without cancellations. Um, uncirculated without, cancel without cancellations can get a bit pricey compared to um, some of the other obsolete or other Confederates that you might find in that same condition. Um, now on to T35, uh, one of my personal favorites as well. Um, extremely rare, uh, Hoyer and Ludwig printed this one, it's a $5. Um, the sheet made is a T27, the rarest type in the whole Confederate series of 72 notes. Um, this is not really far behind. There's 138 of these known, um, so only 25 um, uh, more than the T27. Uh, the T27, they might have discovered a few more. Um, I can't remember for sure um, since Fricky wrote his book in 2014. Um, but anyway, 7,160 7, issued from November 26th through December 5th of 1861. Um, an R8 rarity, so that 138 um, left in existence. Pure Fricky list, whole cancel notes at being around 6,500 to 11,000 for VG, um, which is right on the money. You know, nowadays um, you'll pay about that at auction for them. Um, they're bring crazy sales at both private sales and auctions just because of their extreme rarity and um, how pretty they are. Uh, over here, you have this famous vignette of the Indian princess. Um, it appears on lots of obsoletes as well, as I'll show you on the next slide. Um, over here, then you have a um, couple of slaves loading some bales of cotton onto a steamship um, as the overseer watches. Um, so really nice note. It's like I said, ultra rare, um, you can hardly find them. And when you do, they're a lot of money. Um, now the Bank of Saline, $1. Um, this is a, from Michigan, an obsolete, and you can see the Indian Princess is right there. Um, Calhoun County Bank in Marshall, Michigan, a $50. You can see that there's the Princess. Um, over here, then you have the hydraulic company, um, Bank of Fox River, and there's the Indian Princess right there. Um, again, that's from Wisconsin. Uh, so those are some northern comparison obsoletes. Now, if we go down to the um, bottom, here's some southern comparison obsoletes. We have the city of Columbus, uh, $10 from Georgia. There's the um, Indian princess right there. If you'll notice right here too, um, Juno Moneda, she appeared on, um, this same vignette appeared on uh, T14 from last presentation. So see a familiar face again. <laughs> And then over here, we have the Brooks County $1. Um, this has been canceled, but still really rare. Um, this is a rare obsolete. 
uh, the Indian princesses right over here. You have right here um, the state of Georgia um, notes. They use this vignette a lot in Milledgeville, um, this center vignette. And then finally over here, the Bank of Charleston, $5. Um, there's that vignette of the um, Indian princess over here. And really um, where I'm highlighting with my mouse um, from here and over, um, it actually shares the whole uh, right side with the uh, T35. So there's some um, vignettes of those Indian princesses. Um, and then also Juno Moneta right there. So there's some obsolete comparisons. Now there's a um, Bank of Charleston. This is my example, actually. Um, it's interesting for several reasons. I just thought I'd put a little, it's a kind of a cool story about um, bisectors, they were called. Um, so back in Civil War times, they would really use these bisectors. Um, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can show you if it'll show up um, on my camera, but if you can, okay, that's not gonna work. So um, yeah, you can kind of see it, but um, this is on the back. Uh, they use a part of a Georgia note that I haven't been able to find yet um, as to what it is, um, what obsolete it is. Uh, but they use that Georgia note to part of it anyways, to um, glue it back together once it was, um, you know, once they had to glue it back together. Um, so the indiv individual paying for the service or good um, would cut the note in half and then give the seller um, half of the note when before they did the service or good and then half once they were done. Um, so it was really, you know, it was a smart idea because um, then you had, you know, the seller couldn't spend half of the note. He had to get the other half. So he had to, had to complete the service or good. And then he had to do it to the customer's satisfaction as well before they would give him um, the rest of the note. Also, you have um, in back in Civil War times, you know, the mail service wasn't as good. Um, so <laughs> you had a lot of um, stolen mail. So they would do this. They'd cut up the note in two pieces and send it um, half in one envelope, half in another envelope. That way, if the robbers, you know, they robbed the um, horse that was carrying it or whatever, and um, they'd say, oh, yeah, I got some money and they'd open it. And, oh, it's only half the note. Well, you can't spend half of the note. Um, I guess the person receiving the other half of the note would kind of be sad because then they wouldn't be able to spend that either. Um, but so that was just kind of another ingenious way to um, cut down on robbing and burglary um, of the mail. So that's kind of a cool backstory. It drops the value a little bit, but um, I think it's cool. So, yeah. Now on to T36, this is um, Hoyer and Ludwig as well, and then JT Patterson and company. Um, but this is a $5, 3,694,890 issued from March 31st of 1862 to January 3rd of 1863. Of those 50,001 to 100,000 are left in existence um, today, so in our true rarity. In the center, we find Ceres um, seated on a bale of cotton. She's holding a catechus. Um, a catechus has two serpents winding around it, as you'll see, um, I can zoom in, but it was an ancient, a, a wand in ancient Greek and Roman mythology, uh, and it was associated mainly with healing um, and associated with Hermes um, in Greek mythology and Mercury in Roman mythology. So those two gods, um, which are the same, but just in different uh, mythologies. Um, then there's a sailor over here leaning on a capstan, you see again, and holding a telescope. Um, this note was done on low quality paper, so many didn't wear well. That's why you have a lot in lower grades. Um, higher grades, you know, you'll pay anywhere from maybe four to 500 for an uncirculated example on up. Again, not as bad as some of the other ones that you may find, um, especially, you know, like T35 or um, T23. So there's that, that note. And then the final note in the um, third series, a T37 printed by Blanton Duncan, a $5. Um, very rare in XF to AU, almost impossible to find an uncirculated condition or a high grade example with a good cut is almost impossible as well. 1,002,478 issued from April 7th through September 13th of 1862. And there's 5,001 to 10,000 left today. So in R4 rarity, um, to the left, you have Memminger, who looks like he had a bad hair day. He's, his hair is all over the place, but there's Memminger. And then in the center, we have the sailor. Um, he's leaning on a bale of cotton. 
and sitting down. Um, and then he has a telescope as well with a sailing ship in the background. Then to the right, we have um, Justice holding scales in the background. And then in the front, we have Ceres seated at, or kneeling and she's holding A5. So that's T37. And with that, we get to the four series. Um, only a few types will cover only cover a few types in this presentation, but um, contains many of the most interesting um, varieties in the whole series. Uh, authorized April 17th of 1862. Um, I will show you some pictures of the um, Pierre, from Pierre Fricke's book that give all the different endorsements found on T39 through T41, um, those notes. And you thought I was gonna show you to them in this presentation, haha, -ha, next presentation, I'll show you to them. Um, I'll show you them. Uh, Bland, Bland Duncan printed most of the four series notes. Um, Hoyer and Ludwig and JT Patterson also chipped in some. So here's T38, a $2 printed by Bland Duncan. Um, 36,000 notes he printed erroneously. Uh, this is an error note, actually. Um, thinking that they were part of the third series, he printed at 36,000 with that third series date, September 2nd of 1861, instead of the fourth series date, which he should have put on there, June 2nd of 1862. Um, it's the exact same as T42, um, but it just has that erroneous date. Um, you know, it, there's some debate as to whether or not it should be a um, another, it should, it should just be a variety under T42 or the whole type like it is now, but we're talking about as a, as a whole type, so it's a whole type. Um, there's Judah P. Benjamin to the left. You have a Jewish, Jewish statesman and lawyer who was the Secretary of War um, for the Confederacy. And then in the center, you have the famous vignette of the self striking down the Union. Um, and that's on lots of obsoletes. I didn't show you um, any, I won't show you any of those, but the one that comes to my mind when I think of them is um, the $5 state of Louisiana. That one has that vignette in the center. Um, at approximately the same location as this one is. Uh, there's 501 to 1,000 known today, so an R6 rarity. Um, very hard to find in anything higher than a VG as most of these um, circulated very heavily. Uh, fines, you know, there's a huge price jump from um, very good to fine. So, yeah, um, but there's T38. And then I thought I'd include, here's Judah P. Benjamin. Um, and there's his signature right there, um, a photo of him actually signed by him. And then you have Benjamin's house as well, the Gamble Plantation, um, located in Ellington, Florida. It's a Confederate memorial. I've never been there, but would love to. I'll have to get out there someday. <laughs> But there's that house again you can go and visit it tour it um, so that's kind of neat now t39 uh this is printed by uh jt patterson and company uh and it was the first of the interesting um train notes they call them and uh actually also printed by horror and ludwig sorry i forgot about that um issued well dated anyways may 5th through august 15th of 1862 also September 12th of 1862. Um, to the left, you have a vignette of a milkmaid. And then in the center, you have the famous vignette of the steam train. And this appeared on lots of obsoletes, as you'll see from the next few slides. Um, they call T39 and T40 the train notes, and then um, T41 the horror note. Um, many were saved because they had interest, so there's many in high grades like this one. Uh, you can find them in easily, easily in AU. Um, unk, even gem uncirculated, you can find. Um, you'll pay, you know, anywhere from 450 to 550 probably for an un, uh, gem uncirculated example. However, um, there's many that are not well cut because of the high demand. So if you find one with a good cut, those command a bit of a premium. Uh, 284,000 of these issued, 10,001 to 50,000 are known to exist today. So an R3 rarity. And there's that um, steam. That's the really defining feature of T39 um, is that that um, they call it straight steam because you can see the steam right here coming out of the um, the boiler right there. Um, now on T40, which I'll show you right here, you cannot see the steam coming out of that. So that's um, called diffuse steam. Um, so this is T40 printed by JT Patterson and company. Um, issued from August 9th of 1862 through January 16th of 1863. Um, basically same as the last type. The difference is that 
that steam right there, the diffused steam instead of the straight steam. Um, it was created by Grover Criswell Jr. who actually wanted to, um, it was kind of a marketing technique actually by him um, to sell more of the notes. So I guess if he figured by creating a whole new type, he'd be able to sell more because, oh, now I got to get two types, not just the one and the variety. I have to get two whole types. Um, so more people did that. 214,400 issued, around 10,001 to 50,000 are known today. So an R3 rarity. Um, on the next few slides, I'll show you a few um, obsoletes that have this center vignette. Again, the steam trains right there and then the milkmaid to the left. Now here's the state of North Carolina, $20. There's a circle, I drew a circle around that vignette so you can see it. Um, this is what many people think of uh, as a comparison obsolete um, to the, that steam train vignette on the um, T39 and T40. That's, that's that obsolete that they think of. Um, so there's a $20 right there. This is in really nice shape for this um, type. Now here's the, um, so some of the Southern comparison obsoletes. You have a city of New Orleans $3. Um, this is in really rough shape, as you can see, but it's a very um, rare type. Uh, but there's that steam train right there. You have the um, Bank of Cape Fear $8. Uh, there's that steam train right there. Uh, you'll see this one's a little different. Um, you can see right there the bridge. And then um, down here, this is the um, actual vignette of, you know, it has that. Um, sailing ship in the background. So that's that's the difference, but it's still the same um, steam train, just different background. Um, One dollar state of Georgia. If you're looking for a, a very affordable, you know, a very um, low price example, um, this is your, you know, your go to note. Um, One dollar state of Georgia. Again, this has the actual vignette um, with all the same background and everything. So neat. Um, but a one dollar state of Georgia, then you have the five dollar bank of Columbus. Um, and this is, again, that same steam train, but it does have the bridge in the background, so not the exact same. Uh, and then finally over here, you have the Potomac River Bank um, from Georgetown, D.C., uh, $2. And there's that vignette of the uh, steam train right there uh, with much of the same background. And I've highlighted all of them, if you can see them already. Now on to the northern comparison obsoletes. We have four of them I just included. Um, again, there's many more. I just decided to include four. Uh, Holliston Bank, $5. Uh, Massachusetts, you can see there's that steam train right there with the bridge in the background, so not exactly the same um, background. Danby Bank, $1. There's that bridge again, so not the same background, but the same um, steam train. Uh, that's in Vermont. And then you have the Bank of Sing Sing. I like that name. Uh, it has a certain ring to it, um, but this is a $20 and there's that steam train right there and the bridge in the background. Uh, I find I find this kind of cool on the top. Uh, there's a sorry that was blurry for a minute, but there's a um, horse drawn carriage right there. I never saw that. Um, so that's kind of cool. I was just looking at that yesterday and found that kind of interesting. Um, but there's a $20 bank of Sing Sing and then uh, New York again. And then this is the Business College Bank, finally, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and we have that central vignette. And there they are highlighted. And the last one is the $2 Danby Bank uh, in Vermont. And that has the Milkmaid vignette uh, right there. And I highlighted that as well. Um, also, if you want to, um, if you have Google up or something, or um, you want to search it up, there is a, um, I have a mercantile bank of Waterloo, Illinois, um, proprietary proof sheet. I didn't include it in this presentation, um, but the $2 um, has that milkmaid vignette on it. So, and with that, um, I will leave my email up there for anyone who wants to see it. And that's it. <laughs> so if you have any questions, then go ahead and fire away, Sam. Cool. Thank you, Caleb. All right. Well, uh, one person asked, uh, oh, good question here. What was the ink made out of? Are there notes that were not numbered by, and uh, are there notes that were not numbered by mistake? So I think uh, two different questions are. Um, well, I, I'm, I can't say for certain. I'm not going to try to mislead you, lead you. I do not know um, what the ink was made out of. I'm sure I can find out if I do a Google search. Um, I can't remember if Pierre Fricky's book has it in there, um, but I'd have to look. 
Um, no, there are notes, yes, that were um, not numbered by mistake. Um, there are a few varieties out there, even um, the, uh, like nowadays you have the mismatched serial number errors. Um, there were mismatched serial number errors on um, these Confederates as well. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what, what the ink was made out of. Um, I, yeah, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, they, they did um, not number some of them. Um, there are also remainder notes, uh, which are worth a little less, um, but you don't see them as often as the issued notes. Um, remainder notes were never put out to the public. Um, they were, you know, they sat in sheets until someone cut them up, but they were never, um, they were never signed or numbered. Um, or some of them are signed but not numbered, and some of them are numbered but not signed. So that's, yeah. Gotcha. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, I think there were some remainders for uh, colonials as well. Uh, if I'm trying to remember some of the things I've learned about paper money over the years. but uh, Right. And obsoletes as well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. as well. Oh, okay. So one person uh, just put in the chat, uh, they have a question. Uh, it says, some notes are findable in stock or bonds what does that mean um it's actually fundable um in stock and bonds yes fundable um and that's just you know they were able to be funded by um stock or bonds you, you have you know there's a whole bunch of different um stocks or bonds that they use bonds are a whole different type of collecting um in the back of pierre fricky's book he lists um there's a whole bunch of different, you know, he's got grading CSA bonds. He's got um, the value catalog of bonds. So um, that's a whole different type of collecting and something that I know nothing about. Uh, in the last presentation, it was, oh, geez, I can't remember if it was Archer and Halpin or Archer and Daly um, that printed those uh, bonds. Uh, it was Archer and Daly. Archer and Daly printed those. That's right. Um, but a lot of those bonds, that's what they did. Um, but yeah, fundable and stock and bonds, they could be exchanged um, for stocks or bonds um, with the Confederacy. So that's what that means, basically. Hope that helped. If not, um, yeah, just ask for further clarification and <laughs> I'll do my best. Cool. All right, Caleb. Yeah, it looks like those are the uh, last of the questions that came in. So if anyone else does have more, you can always email Caleb. But uh, Caleb, want to say thanks again for a wonderful and educational presentation on CSA notes. Uh, I hope some of y'all uh, enjoyed it and learned as much as I did from the presentation. Uh, again, we want to thank Gray Sheet for their partnership with the ANA eLearning Academy. And we hope you'll join us for our future webinars. Uh, please check the ANA website, money.org, uh, for more information under the events and webinars heading uh, to see the schedule of upcoming eLearning Academy presentations, as well as to access our archived webinar and video recordings. Our next presentation will take place on Monday, September 27th, starting at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, when our own ANA Education Director, Rod Gillis, presents commemorative coins and what is involved in getting a commemorative coin minted. So, Caleb, thanks again. Really appreciate yep. it. And everyone else, thank you for your time. And, of course, uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. And please continue to enjoy our hobby. Yes. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks for hosting, Sam. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, Caleb. And uh, looks like uh, you alluded to a part three that we'll be uh, seeing uh, at some point pretty soon, huh? Yes, maybe. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. And maybe a part four, too. Um, yeah, I was looking at everything, and it was like, oh, my, I'm not going to be able to include everything. Um, in I, one oh, of course. No, CSA. I, I know enough to know that there's a lot to yeah, go over. Yeah. And, uh, and just a couple hours is not enough time. So, uh more uh, YN dollar earning opportunities for yeah, you. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> look forward to that. I'll be submitting for this one, of course. <laughs> Understood, my friend. I got it. I'll look forward to sending them to you. Well deserved. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day again. Enjoy your hobby. Thanks.